hours on end. So uh, the three topics I've got are one on how to prevent post-intubation hypotension, just some of my thoughts about this. I do want to talk about point of care testing. That one might be a little dry. I can go through that quickly. How many ALS versus BLS folks do we have here tonight? Is everybody ALS or do we have any BLS? Okay, mostly BLS. Okay, so maybe for that one I can go through that a little bit more quickly. Although I would argue that uh, even in BLS, these are, these are good things to know so you know what we're kind of talking about. And then the last topic I think is the most fun topic because it's a controversial topic that I'm not sure how much... Um, how much you know about it. I know I learned a lot about it researching it to get ready for this talk. And I, we have some major controversies with chest decompression in the military. So I'm going to go over all the literature. I, I really did my homework, Dr. Barinholtz. He'd be very proud of me because I, I went to the library and pulled over 60 articles. And I'm really excited about that topic. So that's the last one. So the, the, we'll save the best for last. How's that? And then we'll get through this. Okay. Uh, so once again, Sam Galvano, I'm very interested in EMS. This is really my passion, uh, specifically how we use the helicopter uh, appropriately and what we do on the helicopter in both the military and civilian worlds. That's really been the focus of my research. But I did start off in Frederick County, as you heard, and now I'm in Anne Arundel County trying to become more involved there. So uh, very, very uh, happy to be here tonight. I really like this stuff. All right, this talk, let me go back to the title. So this is something we deal with all the time, and this is a BLS activity. This is a BLS talk. I'm going to mention a lot of high-end physiologic concepts, but this is well within the grasp of any BLS provider, okay? And in fact, I hope you leave tonight really thinking about this because you're the ones who are going to be squeezing the bag after the intubation, guys doing the intubation, um, but this is the most critical part of it, I think. And I think this is the piece we're missing. So this is a bit of a controversial topic in itself, but I will argue there's very good physiology here, okay? And so I'm not going to nerd out too much on the physiology, but I'm going to give you the basics of it so you understand how this works and how you can prevent, hopefully, your patient from crashing the next time they get intubated, whether it's a trauma patient or a medical patient, okay? All right, so uh, we'll talk about the physiologic consequences. When you start positive pressure ventilation, as we'll talk about that, there are, there are physiologic consequences with that, big time, okay? And we'll talk about, I'm gonna, I'll talk about the drugs briefly because I know there's not that many ALS folks here, so I'll give you guys a little bit of that. If you want to talk more offline in the break, we can delve into that big time, okay? But I'm gonna go through that pretty quickly. And then last, literally the last slide that I'll have, I'm just gonna talk about a plan that maybe you can implement as a BLS or ALS provider to hopefully prevent this, okay? Um, all right, so I don't really have any disclosures tonight. I do have funding to the Department of Defense. None of it's related to any of the devices we talk about tonight. I don't have any stock in any of the companies, okay? So just to be clear, um, I'm in also still active in the reserve, but none of that impacts any of this stuff. Okay, so you see that when we intubate, that's what we're thinking, right? We're thinking, okay, the tube's in, great, job's done, We've got an airway, we're good. Let's get them to Dr. Barinholtz, they're gonna be fine. It's actually, getting the tube in is sometimes the easiest part. It's not always the easiest part, okay? That's a separate talk, but um, is it the positive pressure ventilation? Is it the drugs we give? But when you get that tube in, has anybody seen when you get the tube in, the patient crashes and codes right after the tube goes in? How many people have seen that in this, gr in this group? bunch of you have. If you haven't, you will. If you do this long enough, you certainly will. So it's not that you did anything wrong. I mean, obviously we put the tube in for a reason, and I'm talking endotracheal intubation, right? So, um, and it doesn't always have to be endotracheal intubation, by the way. If we have a supraglottic airway or some other airway whereby we're giving some positive pressure ventilation, then that's where this all applies. And my argument to you tonight is, yes, the drugs we give are very important. The drugs can certainly cause hypotension, and they can cause a patient to go into arrest if they're not given appropriately. That is true. And like I said, I'm, I'll talk a little bit about that for my friends uh, from ALS, but we won't go too crazy with that. But I'm going to argue to you that the positive pressure ventilation is the thing to watch out for, and that's one thing you can control um, as a provider, okay? I think that... Uh, have you heard about the controversies with intubation in the field? How many people have heard about it? That uh, there's, there's some real haters out there that do not want paramedics intubating. 
Um, you know, at Shock Trauma, we, we're fortunate that we're able to get the Maryland State Police folks in every Thursday for intubations. But that's hard for the rest of you to do, to get current and stay current. But provided you can, and I would argue that you can, um, I think what's missed here with all these studies, all of them, not one of them really looks at the physiology that's going on. They look at a one-time snapshot of vital signs. They look at a one-time drug dose. They look at, in some cases, a, a bunch of medics that were trained for six hours, and then patients are crashing and arresting after they're intubated. So that makes sense. If you're, you can't train how someone how to intubate in six hours. We spend years learning to do this stuff as physicians, okay? Um, and we wrote, if you want to ever look this up or I could give it to you, there's a, kind of a smart ass uh, editorial that we wrote to Journal of Trauma last year just because we got really sick of seeing study after study stating, you know, if you put a breathing tube in, the patient does worse. Well, that's okay. If, if we do CPR for someone in a cardiac arrest, the CPR is often associated with a bad outcome. That doesn't mean we're not going to do CPR, right? So that's, that's kind of the gist of that article. But I think what's missing with all these papers is a very fundamental skill, and that's how to properly positive, provide positive pressure ventilation and be cautious about it, okay? So let's just talk about the physiology. I'm going to show you a couple videos. I don't want you to get too wigged out by this stuff, but it's good, solid, easy to understand physiology. And by the way, you're going to see more and more of this because as ultrasound starts to creep into our practice, and it's, it's coming, I, I'm sure it's coming, um, we're going to, you're going to be able to see this physiology when you practice. Whether you're BLS or ALS, you will see it. You'll see it, just like an EKG. So when we start positive pressure ventilation, normally, as you and I all take a breath, we generate a negative intrapleural pressure that causes that air to rush into our lungs and gives us a volume of air in the lungs. That's normal physiology that we're breathing right now. We're all breathing normal physiology, negative pressure ventilation. Okay, negative intrapleural and intraalveolar. When you put somebody on a bag, you start bagging them, or BiPAP, or a super you're now completely reversing their physiology. Think about that for a second. You're completely reversed. We don't have a choice. We have to do it because they're not breathing well on their own. But by doing so, we're changing their intrathoracic pressure, which is normally zero, as we breathe right now, to positive. As I'm going to show you in the next two videos, this has major implications. Think about it. Whenever you reverse something physiologically that should be normal, you've got to expect the consequences to that. Okay? So complete reversal of the physiology here. Um, and as this, in, as, this, as this reversal starts to happen, your intrathoracic pressure increases, okay? And I'm going to show you some very basic videos on, on how this works. Now, here's one. This is not necessarily a bad thing. There's your heart. This is a very primitive video. Your lungs, your heart, and what I'm showing here, trying to show is how that heart gets squeezed by the positive pressure ventilation. What's also happening is there's some stretch that occurs as the negative pressure pulls the LV outwards, the left ventricle, but also that positive pressure helps your left ventricle eject blood out. Bonus question. When might that help somebody? What's one thing we do in pre-hospital medicine that can, for patients that have bad hearts, what's one thing we can do? Not drugs, but BiPAP? Yeah? Do you guys do that? Do you do that for your CHFers? CPAP, I'm sorry. CPAP, we, BiPAP in the ICU world, but same principle. So you'll do CPAP, right? Will you do that for CHF? Do you have that in your protocols? Yeah? So what is happening there is, that, is that's actually a beneficial effect of positive pressure ventilation. It's not just keeping the airways open. It's not just giving them more oxygen. It's not just decreasing their work of breathing. You're also helping their heart. So you may not think of it that way, but ventilation, what we do with that machine, that CPAP machine, which, by the way, you probably have some family members that have one. You've seen them. They're very prevalent. I mean, we see them all the time. That's what's happening. That's not a bad thing, okay? That may be a good thing. That may be a good use of positive pressure ventilation, reversing the physiology and helping the afterload reduction. But the, the part that, that kind of comes back to haunt us, think about that heart being completely empty if they're bleeding out. Think about that. Or think about if they're in septic shock and their blood vessels are vasodilated. So now you've got an empty heart 
and you're putting positive pressure on that, and yeah, normally if that heart's full, that'll help the heart, but if it's not full, what do you think is going to happen to the heart? It's going to get squished. It's going to get squished, and the vessels that are bringing blood back to the heart are going to get squished, as I'll show you here. Uh, I'm going to skip. This is just some more nerdy stuff from Guyette, but this is the same concept, just showing in a classic article that talks about how this works. This, this video right here, I think, will really tell the tale. So, um, the plan, okay. So now let's talk about a patient who's hypovolemic. So they're in hemorrhagic shock. Hemorrhagic shock. They're losing blood. You've got here your inferior vena cava. That's the big pipe bringing blood back to the heart. You've got your superior vena cava. That's the one from up top. Bringing blood back to the heart, goes to the lungs, comes back to the left ventricle, and squirts it out to the rest of the body. So in hypovolemia, look what's happening here. When those lungs inflate, look what happens to that IVC and SVC. What's happening there? It's getting, it's getting smushed. And we see this on ultrasound when we're able to look at this. I've got some more physiologic stuff here, but this is what's happening right here. Okay? That's impeding your venous return, the amount of blood coming back to the heart. So when you start positive pressure ventilation on somebody who's hypovolemic, and it might not just be, what's another example of hypovolemia besides hemorrhagic shock? So sepsis is similar because they're vasodilated, a absolutely, and that can, the same problem can happen. What's, what's another simple one that you've probably seen in your practice almost every week, every day? Dehydration, thank you. Yeah, dehydration, Di severe diarrhea, or vomiting, they're fluid down. Fluid down, these pipes are not going to stay full, and when you apply positive pressure ventilation, that can drop the preload to the heart. That load of blood coming back into the heart can get cut off. I'm just showing this is the normal physiology. Normally, our pipes here stay nice and full, so it's, they're not impacted by positive pressure ventilation too much. But my argument to you tonight is this is something we've got to watch out for. It's, hard, it's going to be hard to see in the field if you don't have ultrasound, and I, and I get that, but I'll give you some tips on, on things you can, can maybe look to avoid, okay? We'll talk about that, all right? So that's, that's what happens with positive pressure ventilation. And I've got some other stuff on mean airway pressures and venous return, the mean systemic pressure, right atrial pressure. We can talk about all that offline, but there's, it's, it's, it's a little bit more involved than what I just showed you, but that's the basic concept. Everybody pretty clear on that? Have you heard of this before? You have heard of it, okay. Because it's interesting, because we teach, Dr. Barinholtz, in our line of work, we teach a lot of residents. And um, I remember a case I had, in fact, with I think Dr. Barinholtz was my attending as a fellow, where, you know, lo and behold, the surgeons tried to blame us, really me, because I was the one who pushed the drugs, for the hypotension in a liver patient who was bleeding. Um, and, you know, it was, the patient was sick. It was, it was more than just bleeding. I think there was an infection going on. So super sick patient, you know, liver failure. And um, it wasn't the drugs. We were very judicious with the drugs, very, very judicious. So um, it was the positive pressure. And I didn't even quite understand it. Maybe myself as a fellow, I mean, the patient, we bounced the patient back. But still, you know, you don't want to have to do CPR for a minute or two after intubation. That's kind of poor form. So, but I will tell you, my colleagues and our residents where I work, they'll miss this a lot of times and think that they just gave too much drug. And honestly, when I look back at their drug dosing, it's very, very reasonable amounts of drugs that they gave. Very, very judicious. They were really thinking about it. And I really don't think the drugs are always the culprit. I think a lot of times this is the part that we're missing. Um, and there's some simple things we can do to prevent this, which I'll talk to you about. And so, a lot of times also the adrenaline is running, right? So it's pretty easy to, to squeeze that bag pretty hard. It's really kind of helps create that pressure Absolutely. I think that's the biggest thing. I mean, it's human nature. When we're on a good call where we're really doing a lot of interventions, like life-saving interventions, um, it's, you know, we're excited. We're excited that we're able to do all the stuff that we've trained to do, whether it's in the military or here. You know, either way, it's, it's kind of cool to get out there and do it, but you've got to be careful. That's, that's the message tonight. Just be really careful when, when you do this. I'm not saying be a wimp and give them 10 mils on the bag after tonight, but just like Dr. Barinholtz is saying, try to check yourself. It's hard to do. I find myself doing it. After a really tough airway where we struggled to get the tube in, we got it in, SAT's around 80, we're now trying to get it up. You know, I'll find myself 
squeeze in that bag to try to get recovered a little bit, a little bit more than I probably should. So you got to check yourself. That's, that's, really, that's one of the take homes from tonight, this, this talk right here, without even getting too crazy with literature. But there is literature, and it's, whenever you see a, a number like this, anywhere between 10 and 60 percent, you know the truth's probably somewhere in between. I mean, I don't know what it is here in Baltimore County, I don't know what it is in Anne Arundel County, but it's high in a lot of cases where patients become hypotensive, very hypotensive after they are intubated or after you start positive pressure of some sort. So it's a problem. You will see it in your practice, for sure. Um, this is a study that just came out uh, this past year that's gotten a lot of attention because of this in trauma patients. I'm interested in trauma patients. That's why I'm at Shock Trauma. Um, you know, we enjoy taking care of these patients. They're challenging, um, but you know, we have a good system there where we really dedicate all of our care and, and resources to these patients. But you know, these patients are really at risk to have hypotension after you intubate them. So that's why, um, you know, and in fact, uh, you know, this is a quote from that paper, but it's also in other papers, you know, hypotension after intubation is not, what, what population might that really be bad for in trauma patients? Where do we really want to watch out for lo low blood pressure? Any, any um, specific trauma population where you really want to watch out for that? Yes, TBI, traumatic brain injury. So what if they've got both hemorrhagic shock or bad injuries, and also a TBI. And you, I know you guys see that out here where people start getting fast. I'm you know, coming up here on uh, 9695. I mean, that, that's what you see, right? You see some high speed stuff up here. So concomitant traumatic brain injury, it's even worse to have that blood pressure drop. And they, this, this study showed up to three times the odds of death. There's, there's issues with this study. We could do a journal club on it. They don't have any physiologic data in this paper either which is my main criticism. There's a little bit, but it's, it's still not getting at um, what we really want to get at in terms of the, all the physiology. But the, the message here is this is a common problem in patients who have traumatic injuries and are intubated. It's a common problem. And I'm going to show you a really dramatic example of this um, that I was involved in in just a minute. So the drugs, uh, and again, I don't want to get too nerdy about the drugs, but if you give a neuromuscular blocker, um, it depends on what paper you read. Neuromuscular block acting paralytic. So if you give a long acting paralytic like Vecaronium or Rocaronium, this is for my ALS folks, okay? Um, there is an increased risk of more hypotension, in, at least in this study, but it's a small study. It's a small study. And I, I mean, other studies you'll read where they don't really show that. If a patient has a low mean arterial pressure, if they're hypotensive before, there's no good reason to think if someone's hypotension be, hypotensive before you're intubating that they're suddenly going to get magically better and hypertensive. Now, we'll, we talk about the laryngoscope going in and manipulating, right? You've heard that. And that, that may be a little bit of stimulation, but if the patient's sick enough, there's no good reason to think anyone who's hypotensive is suddenly going to recover miraculously with intubation alone. In fact, I would submit to you tonight, you should anticipate that they're going to get worse, okay? They're going to get worse. So that's just some of the stuff out there. Uh, I'm not going to talk about shock index tonight, but um, maybe we can revisit that. Uh, that's, that's, that's evolving and you, it's really not user friendly right now. There's other things like if they have renal disease, if they're elderly, if they have a mean shock index. These are things that you can also use in your armamentarium. But look, let's start talking about some solutions. Let's, that's, that's, you know the problem now, you're aware of it, and we'll be more aware of it hopefully in your practice, but let's talk about how we can solve the problem. And I'm gonna, here's where we get into some of the drugs. So there, there's the Europeans, they don't have some of the cost constraints we have. Uh, this again is for my ALS providers. We're not gonna, you're not gonna see this drug. I do use it where I work, but I have to go all the way downstairs in the operating room and grab it. And it's more just to teach the residents that there's different drugs we can use to do the same thing. Um, this is a good one for that. You can use it with a neuromuscular blocker or without. This is, so this is fentanyl on steroids. You guys know how strong fentanyl is because you've heard it in the news, even if you're not an ALS provider. If you're ALS, you certainly know about fentanyl. Remy fentanyl is 250 times more potent than morphine. The beauty with Remy, though, is it's gone in eight minutes. It's broken down by esterases. And it doesn't matter if you've got renal failure or kidney failure. It's gone in eight minutes, gone. It's a very short-acting, ultra-potent opioid. 
The problem is it costs about $60 a pop. And compared to fentanyl, which is, I don't know, Dr. Barinholtz, if you've got the pennies, right? Fentanyl is actually dirt cheap, okay? So um, it's hard to, to make an argument to use this, but I can tell you, at least in this study, uh, they used it, they did four different groups, and they found that they had a very low risk of hypotension when they did this, with or without a neuromuscular blocker. There's also the three to two to one and one to one to one, so that refers to the dosing range. This is all pure for the ALS folks real quickly, okay? So fentanyl, you can give them fentanyl plus ketamine plus rocaronium. We don't use rocaronium, right? Does anyone here use it in any other jurisdiction outside of Maryland? Probably not. Um, so that's your neuromuscular blocker. So the idea here, folks, for those of you that are not ALS, what we're trying to do is we don't want the patient to remember having a tube st shoved down their throat. That's traumatic, and that does cause that can cause traumatic post-PTSD and stuff. We don't want that. We don't want them to remember it. But really what we want is a stable, your airway reflexes, even when you're sick, are very strong. I mean, right now, if I tried to put a tube in any of you right now, you, you would want to kill me, right? Because our nerves up here. So all we're trying to do with these drugs are temporarily take the nerves out of the, out of, out of the equation um, temporarily so we can get the tube in safely without having the tube, the cords try to cut off on us, okay? So that's just the BOS side. But I'm, I'm not going to go crazy with the drugs. We're going to just move through this. Okay, so in Maryland, what do we do in Maryland? So everyone here in Maryland is familiar with our rapid sequence induction pro, uh, pilot program, pilot program, which I, I will say um, I think is unfortunate. I understand why it's a pilot program. They make, they make it that way on purpose so they can change it rapidly if there's new advances. So a pilot program, as you know, can be changed, but you've got your protocols there, I think, right? So th you can't change it if it's not a pilot program in Maryland because of all of our bureaucracy. But here's the drugs that they have, Atomidate, Ketamine, Midaz. I'm really happy to see ketamine in there. So that's one of the first things I'll say for the ALS folks. I do think ketamine is a very good choice in trauma patients or hypovolemic patients. That is my drug of choice um, that I will use, but I'll come back to that in a second. Um, but this is our protocol, and I use the term RSII, rapid sequence induction and intubation, because the induction of, the, of anesthesia, which is what you're doing, is just as important as the intubation, okay? They're two different things. They're related. Um, but that's why I like that term RSII instead of just RSI. So, folks, RSI is just a way that we're trying to rapidly take over and get rid of the airway reflexes without bagging the patient too much to insufflate the stomach so they barf on us. That's, what, that's why it's rapid. That's the rapid part of this, okay? And if you go on to paramedic school, this is going to be something you'll learn all about in much more detail. So I would argue when you're going to do RSI, ketamine's a good choice. And let me show you, um, let me show you an example of this. So we just finished a, a study where we collected, and I'll, I'll talk about this in the next talk a little bit. Um, we talked about, we, we did a collected pre-hospital vital signs on every patient. As soon as they got into the helicopter, we were able to um, get the data off the monitor. This is what it looks like in its raw form. So you see the heart rate up here. You see the pulse oximetry signal. You see some blood pressures intermittently. And then you see over here, here CO2. This looks really messy because it is. This is the raw data. But here's the patient that this data was representing. Um, a 60-year-old woman, don't know anything about her history, she's on the back of a motorcycle, and flew off the motorcycle when she got hit, okay? So you can see right off the bat, now here, here's where it gets interesting. She comes off the motorcycle, she's in the field, and this is what we roll up on. Our mon I was on this flight, actually, so I do try to fly with the MSP whenever I can. Um, but I was there, and we got the monitor on, the heart rate's you know, really high. 150s. SAT's okay. Her pressure is actually okay, a little high. So um, the ground unit, and I'm not ba bashing the ground unit, I'm just trying to illustrate how complicated these patients can be. The ground unit wanted to just go ahead and give deltiazem for this. Yeah, well, I mean, okay, you know, the heart rate was way up there. In all fairness, the heart rate was close to 190s, 180s. It was scaring the daylights out of everybody. She was just very hyperdynamic at this point, in pain, trying to figure out where she injured from. She's awake. She's trying to talk, couldn't talk. And so they wanted to give DILT. So that, that was the first thing was, and we'll, this is a segue into what we'll talk about in just a little while tonight. So a good physical exam determined that, no, it's probably not the heart right here. It's actually, 
she needs a decompression for her chest. So they give it needle decompression right around here, and now you start to see the blood, the heart rate come down into a little bit more reasonable range, 140s, 130s. Wasn't a full decompression, by the way. So you can see that heart rate is still high and a lot of variability, a couple ups, a couple down. Look at that saturation. It was actually fine. So the question is, um, if you had a, I mean, I'm not giving you all the information, but she definitely had crepitus on her right side. But in her respiratory rate was, you can see, it was jumping up at times up to 40, but most of the time it was in the high 20s. It, it, towards the end, it started getting back up into the 30s. So she's, she's the Kipnik. You know, the criticism the crew got was, why didn't you just intubate this patient? Why didn't you just intubate the patient? I mean, she's in trouble. She's going to need something at shock trauma where you're bringing her. So can anyone make an argument that you should? What do you think? Yes. What's that? Why not to? So I think that's yes, absolutely. Um, Yeah. Yeah. So it could be a hemo. What's that? So the comments are one. Um, sats were good. The sats were good. So right there, that's one piece of data that we can use. I'll come back to that. I, I like your thinking. I do think you have to be careful with pulse oximetry because it can. You've all seen where they can just fall off the cliff, right? So it can be a late sign, but that is one data point that we have going for us for sure. Um, the other comment was, you're not really addressing the problem. So airway, yes, it's, we always we think ABCs, although we're, 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 we think ABCs. At least for our assessment, that's the way it should be. But if you put addressing why she's so tachycardic, is it addressing why she's maybe more tachypnic? Maybe, maybe it is a little bit. Maybe the work of breathing, you could argue, comes down. But I think you've got to be careful in a patient like this because, look it, her heart rate's kind of, it's coming down a little bit, but... I, my argument here is I think this is, a pa this is the type of patient where it's hard, to not do, it's hard to do less sometimes, but that's actually the right answer. And I think the right answer was, you know, our medic not trying to throw a breathing tube in this patient. We did have a good SAT. We had good end title. We were doing all the right stuff, close monitoring, multiple attempts to decompress the chest. Um, and, you know, with variable success, I mean, you can see the respiratory rate came down. There was a second attempt over here where you see the respiratory rate came down. Um, so this was a patient that the, the decision was made not to intubate in the field, okay? And the medic was answering later for why she didn't intubate. Not, not really too accusatory, but there was a question. Well, why didn't you intubate this patient? Well, this is what happened. So then comes the shock trauma. And now these vital signs here are very high. That's because the monitor was, um, that's what happens when, uh, before they get hooked up to the monitor. So don't ignore these blood pressures. What happened was she was tachycardic. Um, and actually, there was no blood pressure. They couldn't even get a blood pressure at this point. But, you know, it's shock trauma. When anyone comes to the door, if they're really banged up, we're going to just intubate them. A, B, C, patient. Gave the patient some propofol, actually. And you can see what happened right after CPR. And I'm not, I'm not pointing the finger at my colleagues. One of my very close colleagues was the person doing this. And um, the point is, this is what we see all the time. This patient, unfortunately, did pass away because... Um, She's an example of someone who's right on the edge. And I'm just, I'm just showing you this to show you the dangers of what can happen. Is it all positive pressure ventilation? I think in this case, the drugs certainly did not help because they did not probably choose the, the best drug. I, I think ketamine would have been a better choice or maybe a much lower dose of a different induction agent or maybe very little agent, okay? But either way, that didn't help matters. But, you know, you know those are short acting. You can hopefully power through that. But as soon as, it wasn't really until they started ventilating. They, they didn't have any problem with the intubation. They got the tube in in seconds, less than 30 seconds. And, um, you know, but then this happened. And it was, it was really, it was definitely some aggressive bagging because they saw how sick she was. And bam, down. So down for the count. So here's the last, okay. I think things you can do in your practice. Number one, and this is BLS, ALS, really BLS. Watch CPPV, positive pressure ventilation. 
six to eight mils per kilogram predicted body weight tidal volume. That's, that's like religion to us in the ICU world. You're not going to be able to measure that in the field, but the point of that is don't overbag the patient. Judicious. Nice and gentle. Just watch that chest rise. As soon as it starts to come up, back off. If you've got a PEEP valve, I'd recommend in a trauma patient, I like PEEP, we like PEEP in our world, we really do, but it's better to titrate PEEP in a controlled setting in the hospital where we can do a lot of other things to help the patient get more PEEP if we need it. In the field, what do you have to really handle blood pressure problems? What's the main thing you've got? Fluids. You've got fluids, right? And we don't want to give, we know trauma, it's not good. You're going to hear from other speakers. I think you've already heard from some of them in this series that it's not good to just give crystalloids and dump crystalloids like we used to do. I mean, that's how I was trained as a medic. You, get, you just kept pounding the patient with fluids, 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 fluids all day. Very bad. So, yes, volume resuscitation is part of the answer for our ALS colleagues. Definitely have a bolus line ready to go before you start getting ready to intubate. I think the most important, and then, you know, push dose pressors a little bit. That's, we can't do this in Maryland. Other systems can. I do believe there's, a, there's validity for this, and that's something we do in the anesthesia world. Um, so what we're talking about there is the push dose of a vasoconstrictor agent that can help bring the blood pressure up, okay, and re maybe recruit some unstressed blood volume. You can modify your drugs, but I think the most important piece right here is just making sure you're not over-ventilating the patient and cranking on the BVM just like Dr. Barinholtz is saying. I think that's the take home from this. Um, so just be careful out there because the consequences can be catastrophic. And I think part of it is really the positive pressure ventilation. So that brings us to 740. Um, let me stop and answer any questions. Are there any questions about this one? So I think we're doing pretty good, Dr. Barinholtz. Do you want to, uh, do you want to take a... You want to go right into the next one? Okay. Yeah, yes, sir. I'll go kind of, I'll go a little faster with this. There's, I'm going to, um, yeah, I debated about this one. The last one I think you guys will like because that's actually got some skills that are really applicable. And um, it's stuff, really good stuff that I think you should know. But. Um, this is something you might start hearing more about. So uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just not familiar with Baltimore County's. Yeah, there's a lot of discussion about a variety of different ways. Do you have, what's the most common one you guys use here, though? Glucose, right? So you're doing point-of-care testing. We've been doing it for years in EMS. And in fact, you um, should know this from my EMS exam, but uh, for scope of care, what, where are we now with that for EMTs? Can you assist the patient with glucose? You can't assist. You can do it. You can actually do a finger stick and help them get a, a glucose. Okay. You can do it yourself. So that's a BLS. That's BLS. Okay. So, all right, that makes me feel better. So what I'm talking about here, the skills that I'm talking about here are skills you're already doing. I mean, you're doing point-of-care testing. Um, I'm just going to show you a couple other aspects of it. All right. So, uh, again, all that. Um, here's the main thing, reason why I'm personally interested in this, because... For those of you that have been to shock trauma, you've seen the board, the whiteboard, and you hear the call come in, and if we're not doing anything, I'll usually stand next to Joe and listen to the phone and try to figure out, am I going to have to get another OR ready? Am I going to, do we just empty our blood cooler? Uh, this patient's coming in with a GCS of 9 and a heart rate of 140 and a blood pressure of 90. You know, that same patient comes in and 10 minutes later, they're ready to be discharged home in less than 24 hours. They were just super hyped up out in the field and maybe intoxicated. Then you get the patients who have blood pressures that are kind of normal-ish, maybe a little tachycardic, but that's hard to discern what that is because they could just be under pain. And, you know, you're not sure about that one. Could that be the spleen? I will tell you, you I think you were on duty. You were just coming off duty. We had two patients who had, one had actually signed out AMA 24 hours ago and came back in hemorrhagic shock <laughs> the next day, so code one to the OR. Next one right after was another guy, he did not sign out AMA, but it was at an outside hospital with a belly full of blood, but normal vital signs. So the point is, how can we identify these patients? And this has been the subject of some of our recent work, which I'll, I'll share a very tonight. But we're trying to figure out, is there something we can do in the field to get our arms around these patients in terms of diagnostics? Is there something we can do better? Is it a lab test? 
okay? Is it, is it a lab test? Is it lactate? Is it something like that? Or are there better ways that we can do business? But right now, to look at vital signs alone, it's probably not the answer unless we look at the vital signs a little differently. So point of care testing, I'm going to talk to you about the iStat just so you're aware of it. I'll go for the, the most prevalent device out there. It's one I'm certainly most familiar with. You know, I go through some of the electrolytes, but um, I'm going to whiz through those real quickly. Like we said, we'll, we'll keep this around 10 or 15 minutes. And then I want to get into um, maybe some troponin stuff. Then we can have maybe a discussion about some of your views and challenges. Because I think to do this stuff in the field, there's a lot of quality assurance. There's a lot of logistical issues. I'd be interested to hear your take on it, um, honestly, as providers up right there on the front lines. But um, so that's where we'll go. All right, the iStat system. Does anybody use this? I know you have, Joe. Uh, okay, probably not many, but this is big in the military. So they use the, we use these on all of our fixed wing aircraft where we do any kind of uh, critical care or transport. And we say critical care air transport, but a lot of those patients aren't even intubated. Um, okay. So we have a lab analyzer we can use in the back of an aircraft. That's the bottom line. It is quick. It's gotten more reliable. But the problem with this device is, uh, you know, it's very subject to extremes in temperature. Um, if you're not in the temperature range, it's a narrow range. So it's like over 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Then the device will shut down and won't even work. And then if it gets cold, that's a problem as well. So we are one of the pieces of our trial was using this to get a bunch of labs in the field on patients and see if we could correlate that with some other things like continuous vital signs and some analysis that we're doing. So, um, but we, we had a lot of problems. So our, we did this on Troopers 1, Troopers 3, and Troopers 6. And you know where those are, right? So um, Frederick for Trooper 3 and 6 Easton. So pretty good transport times. Trooper 1, not, not as long, 10 to no more than 20 minutes. So it's hard to get all the stuff together to actually do this in the back of a rig. And I think for your transport times, what, what's, your long, what's your transport time from here? I mean, you, you have traffic to contend with. What if you're gonna, if you're gonna bring someone to like Hopkins or Shock Trauma or Bayview, what are you, what are you guys looking at? 20 minutes? 20, 25? So, I mean, I think, I think honestly with the helicopters, it's a little different. With the ground is where there might be more of a use for this. So we do, we do use this with our express care folks in Maryland. I don't know if the Lifeline people use it at Hopkins or not, but yeah. And actually our express care people don't use it a lot. So, but this is literally a handheld, that's where we are in 2018. In your hand, you can get the same labs that Dr. Baron Holt and I can get in our ICU, in your hand, literally in your hand. And it's pretty accurate, not perfect. So that's kind of cool. And the question is, though, just because it's cool, should we be doing it? And I'm not sure the answer. I can tell you a couple things. You can get a troponin off of it. There's a, car a special cartridge for it that you can get troponins. I think that, so my argument for that, my pro for that is um, that can maybe help me sell it to the cath lab a little more aggressively. Uh, where are you taking most of your caths for PCI here? Do they go downtown or where do they go locally? Sinai, okay. So they're pretty aggressive. They don't give you a lot of trouble. They'll get them into the cath lab if you, you got pretty good stuff in the field. Yeah? Were you going to say something, ma'am? Yes, I will. So I'm going to come, let me come back to that. I've got stuff on the end. So troponin is a piece of your, it's basically a, piece, a structural piece of your, um, some of your heart tissue that gets broken off and you can detect it in the blood. You should normally not be able to detect it in the blood. If you detect it in the blood, it's a marker that the heart is injured. And I'll, I'll give you some very specifics at the end. How's that? Okay. But that's what troponin is. I'm sorry. So troponin is a really good marker for if you're having an acute myocardial infarction. All right. You can also get off the cartridges a lactate. You can basically get an arterial blood gas. That's ABG and VBG. It's really a VBG is a venous blood gas. And you can get a whole bunch of electrolytes. So another application that I could argue for with this is... Let's say you're on, um, and so we're going to start using it as our go team, which is, which is probably one of the few places where I think it, it may have applicability. So what if we're on the scene for an hour trying to get someone out of the car? We're, we're working together trying to get someone out of a ditch or they're entrapped, and you guys are working to get them out, and we're all working together to get that patient taken care of. What's one of the problems we may see with a patient like that? Very commonly. You've seen it. Yeah, crush syndrome. Yeah, so... 
you know, would it be nice to have some of this data, maybe get a little bit of a glimpse in their acid-base status, maybe look at their potassium? Yeah, I think that's one of the niche indications for this device, but, um, but I don't know. So the way, the way this whole thing comes up, it, it's very small and portable. It's got a charger, cartridges. You basically put a drop of blood on this, literally a drop of blood, and fill the, tube, fill the capillary tube. It's a capillary tube about that big, and that's all. It's, it takes less than a mil, one milliliter of blood, very small amount of blood. Okay? And you can use finger sticks for this. It's not recommended for all the labs, but you can use finger sticks, and it will actually read. If you, sir. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. That's, the, that, that's been my interest with it. Um, I don't know. We're using a lot of the pediatric tubes where we are, we're at. I, I know this, this is a huge safety thing. So, you, you know, you folks probably, I don't even know if you realize what a leader Dr. Barron holds is with patient safety. Literally an international leader in this stuff. Asking questions like that where, you know, simple things we can change in healthcare that could have a major impact. We, can, we bleed patients down in our ICUs. I'm just going to tell you guys that. We bleed them down. If you keep drawing the blood and they're not bleeding, trust me, their hemoglobin will fall below 7 in just a, a week or so. We see it all the time. We take tons of blood out of patients we don't really need. But yes, there, there is technology with, where you can do it with the drop, drops of blood, and it is very accurate, by the way. Um, the point of this slide is a very busy slide. I can summarize it with this, this one. All right, what we're trying to go in medicine in general is trying to get at what's going on at the cellular level, at the actual organ level. So we have stuff that we all use as BLS and ALS providers, like blood pressure, amine arterial pressure. You can't see that that well. You can look at amine arterial pressure. If it's pretty good, then you're probably in, probably in pretty good shape, you would hope, right? Um, but to be more specific in getting into the future of where we need to be with our profession, it w wouldn't it be great to know if this patient's going to have risk factor for going into renal failure? Wouldn't it be nice to know the patient's going to be at risk to have a heart attack? That would be great to get to there. We're not there yet, but this triangle kind of re re talks about resuscitation endpoints, but the goal here is to try to be able to target single organ perfusion. And so that's my argument. If you can do labs in the field, you start to get at that a little bit. And one of the things you can really look at is lactate. So lactate, if um, you went out and uh, swam 1,000 meters or ran, I don't know, it depends, everybody's different, but if you went out, maybe did a bunch of wind sprints for 30 minutes or maybe ran half a marathon, your la everyone in this room, your lactate's going to be elevated, okay? Um, so lactate is the end product and I, I know we teach this, and when we teach even the basic EMT stuff, you get this a little bit, right? Lactate is really um, converted during anaerobic glycolysis. So the breakdown of sugar can result in more lactate being formed when you're not getting enough oxygen. So it's one marker that your body's not getting enough oxygen at the cell levels, okay? That's the basic way of saying it. However, there's lots of things that can cause your lactate to go up. Lots of things. It's not just because you're not getting enough oxygen, but that's one of the more common things that we think about in, the, in, in terms of septic patients, in terms of patients that have hemorrhagic shock. So this could be a good marker because what we do know is that the lactate tends to go up as a lab marker before you become really hypotensive. So this will change before you start to see blood pressure drop and your heart rate go really high. Okay? That's potentially useful, right? But there's lots of things that can also increase it. Drugs, alcohol can mess it up. Um, and I'm going to skip that. When you don't clear your lactate, this is, some, this is what Dr. Barinholt see and I see in our world in the ICU. We follow these lactates very carefully, and when you don't see it start to go down, like the patient's not responding, it's a marker that they may not be getting enough oxygen or something else is really wrong. And so... In trauma, we have what's called the silver day. If that lactate's not dropping down to normal levels within 24 hours or getting close to it, the patient has a much higher risk for multi-organ failure and all kinds of other complications and death, okay? So the point is lactate's valuable. And, it, and the reason why I'm talking about this is because you can measure it in the field. And in fact, there's a very classic paper in 76, replicated several times, Lactate, actually, venous and arterial lactate does correlate fairly well. 
So that what that means is you could, you could if you got, get a nice clean drop, you could get a finger stick on lactate. Got to be careful that the blood pressure wasn't just going off. You got to be careful that they're not, there's not a crush injury on in that arm or an IV. So it's got to be a really clean stick if you're going to use a finger drop, but you could technically, and, they, and some systems do this, get a venous finger stick just like we do with our glucose. So that's within the realm of anybody here doing any kind of point of care uh, finger sticks. The right way is really to get an IV and try to get a venous sample at the minimum. That's what was really recommended and that's what we did in our study. But, um, but now, what if they've already got an IV? Now you've got to give another IV. You can't really draw the fluid out. You're not really supposed to do that. But the point is it correlates really well. And, you know, um, so that's lactate. So that's an easy one to measure. Um, maybe at the end I'll give you a little bit of uh, some of the stuff we found with our study. But uh, the point is this is a pretty easy one to measure. I'm going to um, tell you what. I'm going to just go right through... Um, for the ALS providers here, I'm happy to give you the slides. I've, I go through basically all the electrolytes, which I don't think we have time for tonight. And I don't, I don't know. We go through the EKGs. I wanted to review that and how to correlate that with. So, you know, if you're seeing wacky EKG things like this, um, loss of your P waves, you know, maybe, maybe getting a lab result can help you understand what's exactly going on. I, I don't know. That's another argument for using point of care testing. Um, but I'm going to skip through some of that. I want to get right to the very end. Um, unless you want to talk about this, but I, I think we got enough other fun stuff to talk about in a little while. So I'm going to, I'm going to skip through this, but this is all stuff that's well within testing realm of registry and everything, right? Um, and the point here is with all of this stuff, if you have a lab value to correlate with that EKG finding, then that could be really helpful, potentially, potentially. Um, cause of hyperkalemia, yeah, all right, we're going to just skip all through all that. Um, so went through all this stuff. Some things you can do in the field as well. That you, so this, this is an argument for um, not using point-of-care testing. There's some clinical signs we can do, such as Shavstek sign. You tap on the corner of the mouth will twitch. You can do the blood pressure inflation. You've got to hold that cuff for three minutes, though. And if you see the arms start to curl up, that could be a sign of... I remember, remember bonus points? Hypo, hypo So anyway, that's my whole point with all this stuff. Let me get to the troponins and we'll wrap it up. How's that? And then I, I can give you guys these slides, but this is putting it all together for a good ALS review when we get into the physiology. I want to just talk about troponin. So troponin, going back to this. So what is troponin? Troponin is this. It's usually structurally bound to the actual myocyte, the myocardial tissue in the heart. And it shouldn't be just floating around your bloodstream randomly, um, okay? Certainly not at high levels. So if it does, what that indicates is that this myocyte is damaged in some way, mostly because not enough oxygen, because there's a coronary blockage, okay? So this, this to me is potentially helpful because um, well, why would this be helpful? Let me ask you that. Why, why would you want to know this in the field? You got an EKG. If you see ST elevation, they're going to go to a uh, 